Why doesn't anybody worry about overpopulation anymore? Because populations are declining and it's a problem for the Japanese and it was a problem for the Germans, which is why Ang Angela Merkel allowed one million immigrants in, which cost her a lot of political capital, but she, she did the right thing for the German economy. And if America didn't have its um, illegal immigrants, it's not producing enough people to, to maintain the, the, the economy. The, the problem with a reducing population is if you're the last generation of growing population, then the ratio of retired people to working people is going to increase as your generation gets older. Now, I'm a baby boomer. I'm not going to go through this because we, we produced another big generation coming afterwards. But Gen, Gen X or Gen Z, I get them confused, Leo, and the millennials are having their children later and having less of them. Problem is, how many of them are going to be around to look after their mums and dads when they get a lot older? So I think these, these youngsters that are, that are not having so many children are really relying on AI um, or medication to take good care of them in, in retirement. Why are we reluctant as a country to adopt identity cards to ensure we can utilise AI better? Don't know. I think it was a good idea. I think it was something New Labour wanted to bring in. Seemed to me a really, really good idea. I don't understand the arguments about it. You've got a passport, you've got a driving licence, you've got an NI number. Why not have an identity card? Make things a lot easier. The, all the arguments go in favour of it. I think the only counter argument I hear is just this um, this removal of confidentiality, and but it strikes me it's a good idea. So I don't see why we don't get on and do it. Well, you said I think it was, I think it may have been earlier in January when we spoke that AI is smart enough to create a clone of you or I. So the tech knows us pretty well. Mm. It has to. Gary, if AI drives the next revolution, there is a high probability of impact on the workforce, increasing inequality. So you talk of the net worth measures in the UK being positive in aggregate. How does the investment team think that a society increasingly split between those who are financially secure and those that are not will impact the economy, government policies and ultimately investment returns? I don't think you've got... You haven't got growing numbers of financially insecure people in the UK. You've got a difference in between the ability of a certain tranche of people to be able to enjoy a better standard of, of living. There's kind of an unwritten deal between the government and the people. The government says, we will tax you, we will govern you, but the deal is, if you trust us, your children will be better off than you and their children will be better off than them and there'll be a, a, a nice net increase in wealth. Well, that kind of deal's been out of the door for the past 14 years because the austerity measures simply haven't worked. So, but look at this another way, Leo. You've got lots of people who have left the workforce, record numbers. They can't leave the workforce unless they've got a range of benefits that enable them to live. If you want to increase the workforce, stop all social benefits immediately and see what happens. You will get more people. The number of people wanting to work will go up instantaneously. But we don't want to do that because we want to have a fairer society, a society that provides regular income for those that are in need. It's not as bad as it's portrayed sometimes, but I accept there is a big gap because at the very top, these outliers, the billionaires, the Musks, the Zuckerbergs, the Gates, drag the distribution to a skew. So it looks then like you've got Mate, let me get an example. Let's assume Zuckerberg goes into a pub with nine other people and we, we do an average of their net wealth. It's going to be massive because Zuckerberg's worth billions and billions. And if the other nine in there uh, are all average Brits, let's say worth about 225,000, the moment Zuckerberg walks out the pub, their average has drastically dropped. So his existence skews it. 
And we could look at these nine other people that are all average, but they look poor compared to him. Hans Rosling did some really good videos on this, uh, explaining how you, you have to look at perspective when you're looking at a poor country compared to a rich one, and a small improvement in the poor country can actually make a massive difference to the people living there. So it's not, some of this issue on inequality isn't around increasing numbers of homeless, increasing numbers of sick children in the UK, although it, you could argue any homeless, any sick children can't get treated is one too many. It, it's more around the dispersion because of the, because of wealth, which in itself is a, is a tendency over time that when new technology comes along, it increases the value for the wealthy and it takes decades for everybody else to catch up. It was the same with coal. It was the same with agriculture, uh, a change in agricultural procedures. It was the same with industrialization. It was the same with electricity. It's the same with oil. And eventually it gets spread. So what you're seeing now is data, technology is making some mega rich people even richer. And in the next few decades, it will pass around and make everybody better off. But it, it, it creates distortions in the, in the initial stages. So you talk about data-driven businesses and initiatives that are making people super rich. What kind of companies are you looking at when we consider data and we consider, say, physical, more like um, agriculture? tractor manufacturers, John Deere for example, not to say that that's something that we have looked at or I, I wouldn't know. How might data affect your views when you're considering potential investments to put clients money into? Does data have more potential for return or do physical assets like the manufacturing bring greater opportunity? Is there a, even a difference? Well there tends to be a super profit for the initial entrepreneurs that go with a new process. And the big change, what, what has made these big companies very profitable is their ability to capture data. So the social media companies worked out that information about you has got a value. And in giving you the ability to go for a service such as WhatsApp or Twitter or Facebook, they were able to collect data on you that you didn't know about initially. Now there's legislation catching up on this. But when they captured your data and the data on 40 million other people in the UK and then 300 plus million people in the States and then a billion in China and a billion in India, as they built this data up, they were able to use it to focus product to the people that were likely to buy, which was worth a fortune to the product suppliers. And the data companies, therefore, the social media companies, made a killing. But they got your data for free. Now, everybody's beginning to wake up to the fact that this has got a value. And the, the governments are too slow to get hold of this. I mean, one of the things we could have done in the UK, we could have auctioned off the rights to collect the data and made a lot of money because guarantee it there's so much profit to be made in this the big social media companies would have paid in the same way we we auctioned off 3g 4g for the telecommunication companies but it's not the government's fault because pioneering businesses and entrepreneurs go way out ahead of everybody else and make things happen before we've all caught up. Now, what do we all think is gonna happen in the next few years? You're, you're gonna get more and more regulation on the data. Government and legislation will catch up, making it more difficult for these companies to make their super profits, which is why we are not keen on holding for the long term those companies that are making their money primarily on data.